All right, Truman and Cold War America, the time from 1945 to 1952. Now, first things first, talk about demobilization under Truman. Now, Truman and Roosevelt, just do a quick background on them, were totally different guys. I mean, uh, unlike Roosevelt, who had gone to Columbia and Harvard, Truman had no college at all. Uh, he had no inherited wealth, no early contacts with the movers and shakers of society. He didn't grow up in cosmopolitan New York, but rather Independence, uh, Missouri, a uh, small town, unglorious town near Kansas City. He'd served in World War I as a captain of the artillery in France. Afterwards, he came back home to start a business of his own, which totally flopped. So uh, that it flopped in 22. That same year, he ran to be a, a commissioner or a county judge, excuse me, a position, an election that he lost in 26. No, in 24, but he won it back again in 26. By 1934, he runs for Senate and wins. And um, basically, he was chosen to be uh, Roosevelt's vice president during his last term. And he was totally shocked when Roosevelt died. What were his domestic proposals of 1945? Well, he wanted to continue and enlarge the uh, New Deal programs, but it's totally shot down by Congress. One of his first big things to do after the war was bring down our military size, demobilization. Basically, it was an incredibly rapid reduction. Uh, we went from an army and military services, 12 million men strong, to in 1947, it's down to 1.5 million. Then by 1950, despite increasing world tensions, it's reduced even further to 600,000. Now what else big is going on in America? Well, guys, we have a baby boom going on. I mean, you have guys coming home to rejoin lives with their wives with a time that's supposedly full of opportunity, which made the population spurt of the 1930s. During that decade, 9 million kids were born. But during the uh, decade of the 1940s, more than 19 million are born. And so you now have a whole new group of people that are going to be in need of consumer goods. But something that's interesting is that usually following every war, there's a depression. Well, the government put some things into place to allay that, like uh, unemployment pay for the veterans that were getting out, uh, social security benefits, and they also passed the Servicemen's Readjustment Act, which is known as the GI Bill of Rights. That's still around today. A $13 billion was spent for veterans' education, vocational training, medical treatment, unemployment insurance, and loans for like building houses or building businesses. Now guys, why was it a smart idea to uh, give your veterans uh, the ability to go to college, which, by the way, is still around today. And if you're a Texas veteran, if you spend all of your uh, U.S. GI money, you're covered by the Hazelwood Act, so you get even more thrown into your college tuition. But why is that a smart idea? Well, how many of y'all are going to go on to a four-year college? Probably. How many of y'all are then going to go on to even more college? Probably. Guys, while you're in college, are you going to have a full-time job? If you're smart, if you're wise, don't. Okay, just because it is so tough. Meaning, these guys aren't going to be out there competing for full-time jobs. They're going to be off the labor market. So you give society a chance to absorb them once they graduate. Not only that, but they get a chance, an opportunity to become a better worker, a more efficient, more wise resource that can be used. 
Also, guys, uh, you had an American public that during the war, they built up their wealth. Why? Because they couldn't buy everything they wanted to. Because of rationing and stuff like that. And now that the war is over, rationing is going to be over, and they're ready to buy. So rather than having a depression, we have the exact opposite of inflation, where the cost of goods starts to go up. Now, the fact that the cost for goods are going up, the factories find themselves in a problem. Why? Because during the war, they had put in price controls. What are price controls? Basically, where the government said stuff like, you can't charge any more than a dollar for a piece of bread. Well, the price for that baker of wheat, it's going up, and he can't afford to pay his workers anymore because he's not going to make any money. So, uh, but the workers, they want more money because the cost of everything is going up. So as early as six weeks after the war, uh, the United Automobile Workers at GM walk out on a strike, okay? And the U.S. government could have used wartime measures to go in and reopen the factory. However, instead, they go to management and they said, look, why can't you pay these guys more? And they said, well, look, if you've got these price controls on us, you've kind of handcuffed us. So what the government did was they lifted the price controls, saying now the market could regulate the price of a good. But it was understood that management would then turn around and pay the workers more. Now, the Office of Price Administration, that was the government agency that had been in charge of the price controls and basically what they did to render that department kind of useless was they made the law so Byzantine and, and uh, curious that basically affecting the price on anything was next to impossible. However, the only area where the Office of Price Administration was able to effectively maintain price controls was on sugar and rice. And because we have an artificially high price on sugar and rice, uh, Americans pay more for those two resources than anyone else in the world. Even though in Texas we grow so much rice, we export it to China. Yeehaw! Ready for the next one? Huzzah! Truman's early domestic policy. All right, the first things we've got to go through are the congressional elections of 1946. Now, guys, at this time, there was a whole lot of discontent with Democrats. Why? And guys, this is so American, you know, when, uh, when society desperately needed government to save them, they loved the Democrats and the New Deal and all that stuff that was coming out. But now that America's kind of back, getting back on its feet, they don't like the rising prices of goods. They're not crazy about the labor strikes. And if you're a businessman, you're not so excited about the fact that higher wages are eating into your profits. So the conservatives don't, the conser far right Republicans don't like Truman. Meanwhile, Truman, because he fired his Secretary of State, Henry Wallace, over a disagreement in policy, the far left, they don't like Truman either. They both kind of joke and say, to air is Truman. <laughs> anyway, Repu the Republican Party, they win majorities of both of the houses of Congress, which is the first time that had happened since 1928. You ready? Indeed, they wanted to constrain labor so greatly that uh, the Taft-Hartley Act was passed. What did that do? That put a whole new slew of restrictions on labor. It did stuff like it banned clothes shops. Now, what's a clothes shop? A clothes shop is, if you're not a union member, don't even bother applying. You can only apply if you're a union member. It banned those, but it did allow union shops. What's a union shop? Well, example, here in Texas, AT&T is a union shop. If you're not a union member, you can apply, but 
if you're hired, you have to join the union. And it made some of the uh, strike tactics illegal, like secondary boycotts, jurisdictional strikes, the refusal to bargain, and campaign contributions. Well, as you can guess, Truman vetoes this thing automatically, which made labor really like them. But Congress, they have majorities over them, so they simply override his veto. And by 1954, 15 states, mainly in the South, and by the way, Texas is one of them, passed something known as right to work laws that pretty much uh, neuter the power of unions. And unions in Texas and those states aren't very strong at all. But on the flip side, those states got certain things like, oh, I don't know, national headquarters of Toyota, uh, Alabama and uh, Georgia, I believe they're getting new Mercedes-Benz uh, production facilities. In Texas, we got the Toyota Tundra factory. So who knows? Ready for the next slide? Tax reduction. Okay, Truman felt, hey look guys, when y'all were down, the government was there to help you out. We spent a lot of money on all those New Deal programs. And now that we're doing better, we need to keep taxes high so we can pay off our deficit. Well, he vetoed a $5 billion tax cut that Congress and the Senate had put up. And you'll never guess what Congress and the Senate do. They overrode his veto. It's passed anyway. Ready for the next one? Oh, yeah. About the tundra thing, is that because, or is that why all tundras have that, um, like, Texas flag? Yeah. And the reason, and one of the reasons why Toyota chose Texas is because instead of opening up in, like, Vietnam or down in Belize, is because they got around so many of the tariffs that are placed against foreign trucks by building it domestically that it was worth it to them to build it here rather than in Belize or in a foreign country because they were going to save so much money. Huh? I always just thought that everyone that owns a tundra just really likes Texas. <laughs> okay, the National Security Act. Guys, by 1943, it was really bothering us. The whole Pearl Harbor thing. How could we not have known? We vowed that we would never be hit by a surprise attack again. So the National Military Establishment was created, as well as the National Security Council, a part of which was the Central Intelligence Agency. And that is why, since World War II, we have not been struck by a surprise. Oh, anyway. Also, they passed the Presidential Secession Act. What was that? Basically, it was written down and codified. Okay, president gets killed, goes vice president. Vice president gets killed, goes to the and so on. Uh, who would become the president? Who was next in line? And finally, they passed the 20, or they introduced it, and the states passed it, the 22nd Amendment that said, uh, guys, you can only be president for two terms. I mean, Washington had started that out. All the presidents had kept it, except for Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who won four terms. Ready for the next slide? Development of the Cold War. All right, now before we get into the Cold War proper, which is kind of the hostility and tensions that the US and the USSR had, we gotta talk about something that was uh, nothing more than a dream, the United Nations. Basically, um, Roosevelt expected the post-war world to be divided into different spheres of influence in order to maintain security, he wanted to form a world organization. So the outline of the United Nations 
I mean, that had originally started back as early as the Atlantic Charter. But on um, 1943, by autumn, delegates from the Big Four, the US, Great Britain, Russia, and China, issued the Moscow Declaration of General Security, calling for an international organization. And on, I don't know why this should be here. On April 12th, two weeks after Roosevelt's death, on April 25th, 1945, 50 representatives met at the San Francisco Opera House to draw up the charter for the United Nations. Additional members would be introduced with a two-thirds vote. And for that whole world security thing, they formed a security council that would have primary responsibility for the maintenance of peace and security. It was an 11-member board that was expanded to uh, it was an 11-member board that was expanded to 15 in 1965, made up of six, now 10, elected members serving two-year terms, and five members that could not be removed from the Security Council. Basically, these were the big boys in the House. The US, England, USSR, France, and China. And this was before China had turned communist. For a mild one. one is revolution. And the Senate goes ahead and it ratifies us getting into this organization. Ready for the next one? All right, now we got to get to our relations with the USSR and the Soviets. Guys, this relationship had been plagued by mistrust. I mean, ever since. They had kind of turned their backs on uh, England and France and later on the U.S. in World War I by signing the peace treaty with Germany. All those nations had kind of given Russia the cold shoulder. Indeed, the U.S. even had troops in the USSR until 1920 because we were fighting for the Tsar's side. It's not until 1933 that we even diplomatically recognize the USSR. And within a few short years of our recognition of them, they make an alliance with Hitler. Then they invade Poland, which starts off that whole World War II. And it wasn't until Stalin, when they're attacked by Adolf Hitler, we kind of become uneasy allies. And uh, in order to deal with uh, Soviet threat, Truman wanted to try to create American spheres of influence around the world. But events of 1945, in the shadows of the peace, uh, after the defeat of Nazi Germany, made this very difficult. For example, I mean, before the ink is even dry on the Yalta agreements where we told Stalin he needed to put in, let the people elect their own governments, he totally turns around and he puts in compliant puppet governments of his own. Uh, for example, in like Poland, they take over Poland, they move the capital from Lublin, that had been made the capital after World War I, up to Warsaw, they do the same exact thing in Romania. And basically because, you know, we just gotten done fighting an exhausting war, we didn't want it to last any further. Pretty much the post-war settlement treaties confirmed Soviet uh, control of those areas. going to do about the bomb. Guys, for everybody who thinks America isn't an incredible country, this is proof that totally refutes it. 
We even knew that that was way much power to have in the hands of one man or country. America has been the only civilization in the history of the world that had the power to take over the whole world, and we didn't do it. Indeed, we wanted to give it to the United Nations. We, we wanted to give it to the United Nations and let them create, <coughs> excuse me, the International Atomic Development Authority that would have the monopoly of atomic explosives and atomic energy. While the Soviets, however, were afraid of the Western influences within that group, and they said, um, instead of that, why don't we just outlaw the manufacture and use of atomic uh, energy and bombs, and they veto the plan? Well, they veto the plan, the U.S. says, hey, up your nose with a rubber hose, we take our stuff and go home. Ready for the next slide? Yes, you are. So what are we going to do about Russia? Well, we go to George F. Keenan. Basically, he was the counselor at the American Embassy in Moscow. And he totally believed that the Soviets would try to fill every nook and cranny available in the basin of world power. And in order to stop this, he believed the main element of any United States policy towards the Soviet Union must be that of a long-term, patient but firm and vigilant containment of Russian expansionist tendencies. In other words, wherever they are trying to bust out, we got to stand up strong against them. Now in time, he believed that uh, relations with the uh, Soviets would get better. He also believed that the Soviet Union, like the Tsarist Russia before it, bore within it the seeds of its own decay, and the sprouting of those seeds is well advanced. Basically, he began a policy in dealing with Russia, that of containment to counter the growing fear of Soviet aggression in the world. Now, would this work? Hey, for proof, he didn't have to point any further than Iran. After the end of World War II, Russia, the Soviet Union, had troops in the north. We had troops in the south and Britain. Both sides were supposed to pull out all their troops, uh, but six weeks after the war, Soviets were still there. We didn't withdraw our tanks. Indeed, we called in even more tanks, which, at that aggression, the Soviets retreated. With their retreat, we retreated. So how is this going to work out in the real world? Well, uh, you have the birth of the Cold War. Because you have communist influence in Turkey and Greece. The Soviets long for a base in the Mediterranean. I mean, it would be great for trade, as well as a warm water port for defense. The USSR began to pressure Turkey for territorial concessions and the right to build a naval base in the Bosphorus. The Bosphorus is that waterway that connects the Black Sea to the Mediterranean Sea and also divides the city of Constantinople or Istanbul, whichever you prefer. Then in 1946, civil war broke out in Greece. You had one side, the democratic side, that was supported by the British and the other side was a communist-led faction supported by Yugoslavia, Bulgaria, and Albania. And after just one year, the British ambassador comes to the U.S. and says, hey, look, guys, we ain't got no more money, honey. You got to come in and help us or it's going to fall to communism. <laughs> so what happens? Ready? Truman makes a strong appeal to the American people, asking Congress for $400 million in economic aid for Turkey and Greece, and to send American military advisors. 
In his speech, he laid out what would be known as the Truman Doctrine, where basically he said it would be the policy of the U.S. to support free peoples who are resisting attempted subjugation by our minorities or outside pressures. Congress passes it, and by 1950, they spent $659 million on the program. Well, did we get our uh, money's worth? Well, Turkey was able to achieve economic stability and uh, the democratic side in Greece had won the Civil War in 1949. Now this was basically because Yugoslavia, one of their biggest trading partners, tried to break off the Soviet Union. Soviets went down and crushed that whole thing. And so the communist led faction pretty much had nothing. But regardless, with this speech, now America is committed to the containment of communism worldwide. The Marshall Plan. Blink. Basically, guys, this is kind of like the New Deal for Europe. Why? Because Europe was swept by the devastation and damage of World War II. I mean, there was a severe drought in 1947, followed by a harsh winter that had destroyed crops. There was a coal shortage in London that forced some of the civilians to only be able to light or heat their homes for a few hours each day. People in Berlin were freezing or starving to death. The transportation system was in shambles. About the only thing that was doing really good were the communist parties in Italy and France. Now what about the UN? Well, aid from the UN helped out a little with necessities, but guys, it didn't provide the money for an economic overhaul. That would jumpstart these countries back. And basically, George C. Marshall, our Secretary of State, called for a program of massive aid to rescue Europe. Our policy, he stated at Harvard graduation in 1947, is directed not against country or doctrine, but against hunger, poverty, desperation, and chaos. He offered aid to all of the European countries, including the USSR. Now guys, why was it, what is this whole deal about hunger, poverty, desperation, and chaos? Why were those the things that he wanted to fight against? Well, there once was a country that had been defeated in war, and was forced by all the other countries to pay back the cost of that war. Um, and basically nobody had money. They even ran out of money to pay off the loan. People were desperate. And along came a guy saying, I've got the answer. I know exactly what we need to do. We're going to get this thing going again. What was that guy's name? First it was Mussolini. Then it was Adolf Hitler. And now today, some people in the war against terror said, that's what Osama bin Laden did. Hey guys, I've got the answer. I've got the answer. Follow me. Do desperate men do desperate things. Oh, by the way, Osama bin Laden was like a millionaire from a Saudi family. So even though Maltov, who was the Soviet foreign minister, and 80 delegates met in London on June 27, 1947, along with France and England, he got word from Moscow to withdraw the delegates from this imperialist scheme. And in December, Truman submitted his plan for the recovery to Congress. Now those who are kind of on the fence, well in February, uh, communist coup d'etat 
ended the last coalition government in Russia. Russia occupied Europe. So the Marshall Plan got passed through and lasted from 1948 to 1951, pouring $13 billion into Europe. Now, how would that help America? How would that help America? Well, not only that, but those places need to rebuild. About the only economy that didn't have their factories destroyed was America. So if they want to buy steel, who are they going to buy it from? Oh, yeah, us. Need come. Oh, yeah, us. Oh, sure. Here's money. I'll pay you back. <laughs> but it did allow them, it allowed corporations like Volkswagen to get back on their feet building the, the Beetle, and now Volkswagen owns Rolls Royce, as well as Audi, other companies. All right, getting back to Germany, dividing Germany. Uh, the German economy pretty much had stagnated. You pretty much had zones of occupation, because you can see here, it was divided uh, among the Allied powers. Uh, USSR is the green. Uh, Britain is the purple, the U.S. is the yellow, France is the blue. Now, if you look at that, France's portion of the land isn't as big as the rest of the countries. Y'all know why? Because France got beaten in World War II. And the Free French fought with the Allies, but basically uh, England and the U.S., had to give up some of their territory to give it to France. Because now we were all one big happy. Well, these things started to slowly evolve into functioning governments. And by 1948, the British, French, and Americans had united their zones in West Germany. And the Germans then organized state governments and elected delegates to a constitutional convention. Now, guys. Guess who the formation of a new Germany, even if it was Western Germany, guess who it scared the hooey out of? Huh? Yeah, the Soviets. Now, wait a minute. Why would the Soviets, why would a united Germany freak out the Soviets? Huh? No, let's see. Well, kind of oh. Who invaded, who invaded Russia in World War I? Oh, yeah! Germany! And then they signed the Treaty of Brexit Lipstock, where they took more than a third of their land and their arable soil. Oh, yeah, that was Germany. Oh, wait a minute. Who uh, invaded them and broke, turned, broke the agreement, invaded them in World War II, causing incredible slaughter in what the Soviets called the Great Pit? That was Germany. The whole United Germany thing, Russia isn't so crazy about it. So, they're going to put a stop to it. Now, guys, over here in this section, I'm not sure exactly where Berlin is, but it, too, was a divided city that had an American zone, a British zone, a French zone, and a Soviet zone. I think that's it, but I'm not certain. But, basically, it was supposed to be, according to treaty, allowed traffic to cross into it to deliver supplies for the civilians. Well, the German, I mean, the Soviets really do not like our unification. So in April of 1948, they began to restrict traffic to West Berlin. And by June of 1923, they stopped all traffic. Soviets basically hoped this blockade would force the Allies to either give up Berlin or their plan to unify West Germany. Well, remember, we are the policy of containment. So the U.S. military commander stated when Berlin falls, Western Germany will be next. If we need to hold Europe against communism, we must not budge. Truman believes them and sent in a massive airlift. Now, this whole thing seemed impossible. They needed 4,500 tons of food and coal each day. The Allied forces drew in planes from around the world, 
And by October of 1948, they were flying in 5,000 tons of food and equipment and coal each day. Indeed, that airport got so busy, there was a plane landing or taking off every 30 seconds. Now, it wasn't the same plane, because, you know, they'd land the plane, and, you know, the crews would get out, you know, go out by the fence, you know, and uh, they unload the whole plane. Germans were so desperate for resources, they would even sweep out the planes, capture all the coal dust. Well, one time, and as you can see, there were a bunch of war kids that were German. They'd been born during the war. They hadn't really had candy or anything like that. So the pilots and crews would go over to the fence that separated the airfield from the people of Berlin. There was a huge field, the fence, and then the landing field. And you know, they came like that stick where we would spare the gum to the kid. The German kid would get that stick of gum, he'd rip it in half, and he'd hand the other half to another German kid. Then they'd take off the foil to eat it, you'd hand the foil to another kid. So they could at least lick it, taste something. Well, this pilot said, hey, hey, listen, uh, next time I come in, y'all go out to the field, because we'll get a surprise. And they said, well, how are we going to know it's you? He said, well, if I'm coming in, I'll wiggle my limbs. And that's how you'll know it's me. So I'll fix it up. So he goes and he and his crew go back. And basically, they go to the PX, which is like the store on base. They buy a case of Virtue's candy bars, chocolate bars. They buy some handkerchiefs, make little parachutes, and of course as he's coming in, he wiggles his wings. All the kids run out and they drop the little chocolate bar parachutes out. And the kids go absolutely crazy. Well, he lands, everything's unloaded, goes back to his base. The CO commanding officer doesn't call for him. So he's like, cool, let's keep doing this. So they kept doing it. Finally, after about two weeks, uh, it, when he lands, the squadron commander says, hey, the CO wants to see you, commanding officer. And so, okay, so he goes to the commanding officer, and the uh, commanding officer says, do you want to tell me about uh, Captain Wiggly Wings? And he said, well, I've been dropping a couple of bars, and da, 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 da. And he goes, so you're the captain, huh? He goes, yeah. He goes, I got five sacks of mail for you. Because basically it was the German kids writing thank you notes and stuff like that. Except there was one letter that was kind of sad. It was from a German kid who had broke, he had either broken his arm or his leg. So he couldn't get out and get the candy bar. But he really wanted a candy bar. So what he did was he drew a map of where his house was. And he was like, you can drop some uh, chocolate over my house if you would. But, and then, but what's funny, so, and then of course, news of this gets out. Hershey's gives away tons of free chocolate for this selling bees in America, sell up the little uh, parachutes for the candy. I mean, it's great PR. Well, another young pilot, he says, hey, it's good for uh, West Berliners. Let's go for East Berliners. Because as they were taking off, because they were in the furthest eastern part of Berlin, they just barely skimmed over uh, East Berlin, the Soviet sector. So he got the King Bar's parachutes, and he kept them, and then when they were taken off, as he just creeping out over East Berlin, they dropped the chocolate bars. He lands back at base, the squadron commander says, hey, the CO wants to see you. He says, okay, he goes in there, and of course the CO says, you know, did you drop chocolate bars over East Berlin? We thought it was like, yeah, that was me. You know, thinking he was going to be praising all this stuff. And the CO said, you do not do that again. We got a telegram from the Soviets saying that if you do that again, that will be considered an act of war, and they'll start shooting our planes down. So guys, tensions were high. Um, but by October 1948, we were flying in 5,000 tons of food and equipment a day. And from June of 48 to May of 49, more than 1.5 million tons of supplies, or half a ton for each of the 2.2 million West Berliners, was delivered. So on May 12, 1949, in talks with the Soviets, they agreed to lift the blockade in exchange for a meeting of the Council of Foreign Ministers in Paris. 
where the German Federal Republic was allowed in the West, and by the end of May 1949, a German Democratic Republic arose in the Eastern Zone. Ready for the next one? Well, guys, we decide, hey, we need allies. So the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO, is formed. That basically was a military organization with members from the US, Britain, France, Belgium, Netherlands, Luxembourg, Canada, Denmark, Iceland, Italy, Norway, Portugal. In 52, Greece and Turkey joined. And in 55, Germany and Japan joined. Basically, we're kind of like the three musketeers. All for, all for one and one for all. Any attack on any one of us is going to be treated the same as an attack on all of us. And basically, you know, it's gonna get, it's gonna get really hard fast. And it's come as no surprise that in 1955, uh, the Soviets formed their own organization in Eastern Europe known as the Warsaw Treaty Organization. That would also be known as the Warsaw Pact. Ready for the next one? Then we have the establishment of Israel. On May 14th, 1948, Britain, which had had kind of Palestine as a protectorate since the end of the uh, World War I, well, the mandate where they had authority over it expired on May 14th. They set out uh, plans for a redistribution of the land to both the Arabs and the Jews. Um, and on May 14th, 1948, when they left, minutes after they leave, Israel uh, declared its independence. Truman recognized them within minutes because one of his uh, business partners had been Jewish, came to him pleading, as well as the fact <coughs> that a lot of the ministers had also talked to Truman. Uh, starting an alliance that has been many years long with the one land that has no oil in a land where there is tons of oil. Except they did have some <coughs> when they owned the Suez, but they gave that back. I believe they might have some near Haifa now. Anyway, domestic policy, politics. All right, the division of the Democratic Party. Basically, growing up, Truman had always believed that whites and blacks liked living in segregated society. However, in the fall of 1946, Truman hosted a delegation of civil rights activists. This delegation graphically described incidents of torture and intimidation against blacks in the South leaving Truman totally aghast. So on July 26, 1948, Truman took the step of banning racial discrimination in the hiring of federal employees. And four days later, he issued an executive order ending racial segregation in the military forces. Now guys, that is a radical step. Okay? Why... Why was it a good thing that it was done with the military? <coughs> huh? Speak up. Maybe, but, well, I mean, you had the same amount of people, except they were at separate bases and separate camps and stuff like that. And I mean, this was something that was totally not done in America for the longest. Why was it good that the military was a place where this was carried out? His morals are to follow. Not only that, but he's the commander in chief, the president. Everybody below him has to follow his order. If you're a private in the army and the sergeant tells you to do 10 push ups, what do you do? You do 10 push ups. What if you don't feel like it? You do 10 push ups. But what if you really don't feel like it? You do 10 push ups. Guys, it was a controlled environment and it wasn't successful. By 1960, the military was the most diverse, uh, 
excuse me, inclusive and racially integrated of all American organizations. <coughs> Indeed, desegregating the military was in Truman's opinion the greatest thing that ever happened to America. Next slide. Now, <coughs> Now Truman's got to actually run for the presidency. First thing he has to do is skirt the whole idea that he's not up to the job. Because remember, the reason he got in is because Roosevelt died. So basically, he wants to go to stalwarts of the New Deal Coalition and look on them for strength. And um, Southern conservatives totally resented Truman's support for civil rights. And by the way, there used to be conservatives within the Democratic Party, and there still is today. Um, and, they, and so the far right of the Democrats don't like his support for civil rights. The far left of the Democrats still are burning because he had fired Henry Wallace. Well, what was he going to uh, seek in his election? Truman used the State of the Union address to set out the agenda for the election year. It offered something to nearly every Democrat. Uh, he promised federal aid to education, increased unemployment benefits, federal support for housing, rent controls. Rent controls means you can't charge any more than X amount for rent of a property, rural electrification, a higher minimum wage, laws to admit thousands of displaced people, more money for the Marshall Plan, and a cost of living credit. And thus endeth the lesson. Okay, this is where we got up to last time. This is where we left off. Uh, basically, uh, we talked about how he tried to surround himself with a New Deal coalition, but uh, conservative Southern Democrats really didn't like him, nor did the far left Democrats for his treatment of uh, Henry Wallace. Uh, he really emphasized human rights, promising federal aid to education, increased unemployment benefits, federal support for housing, rent controls, rural electrification, a higher minimum wage, laws to admit thousands of displaced people, more money for the Marshall Plan, and a cost of living tax credit. I mean, something for basically everybody. Well, then when we get to the election itself, who are the candidates? Well, the Republicans, they chose a very popular New York governor, Thomas Dewey, who said basically he was going to do the same things that Truman did, only he was going to be better. The Southern Conservatives, uh, well, the Democrats, they nominated Truman. Southern Conservatives uh, basically split from the party because of uh, Truman's uh, civil rights plans. And they formed the Dixiecrats, and their candidate is J. Strom Thurmond. And the Progressive Party, they separate from the Democrats, and they support Henry Wallace. There you go. So what does Harry do? He goes out on a 31,000 mile whistle stop train tour where, uh, where he yells at the Do Nothing Congress. Basically the uh, crowd would shout out, give him hell Harry, uh, to which uh, Truman would respond, I don't give him hell, I give him the truth. And they think that's hell. Well guys, Everybody thought Dewey was going to beat Truman. Everybody thought. I mean, here's the Chicago Daily Tribune. That's Harry Truman. The headline is, Dewey defeats Truman. Because the way you made money in newspapers back then, you were the first one with the news. And when the initial polls started coming in, it looked like it was going to be Dewey. So they went ahead and printed out that paper. I mean, this is kind of like when Trump beat Hillary Clinton. It was just totally amazing. 
People didn't expect it at all. Basically, um, Truman won. 49% of the popular vote. Dewey won 45% of the popular vote, giving him uh, 303 electoral votes to Dewey's 189. And actually, the split in the Democratic Party helped out Truman because many black voters, especially in the South, there's no way they were going to vote for the Dixiecrats. Now, Truman wasn't the only Democrat that was swept in. Basically, uh, they also filled our Houses of Congress. You had like Hubert Humphrey and landslide Lyndon Baines Johnson that uh, went all the way up into uh, the Senate. And basically, uh, you know, Teddy Roosevelt had his square deal. Uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt had the New Deal. And uh, basically, Truman had the Fair Deal. That's what he called his plan, his want of uh, New Deal-like programs. Ready for the next slide? Well, the world, however, might have to take precedence because the Cold War heats up. Truman's foreign policy. Now, this is out in China, which by 1949 is fast unraveling. You have the Chinese nationalists under Chiang Kai-shek that the U.S. had supported fighting against the communists led by Mao Zedong. Now, <coughs> uh, Mao was the communist leader. He was in the army. He got thrown out of the army by Chiang Kai-shek. Uh, and then he and his followers during the winter, his thousands of followers, during the winter of 1934 to 1935, were marched from the southern part of China uh, to the northern part. Uh, and when they got to the end, there were only like 141 communists left. That's how many died in what was known as the Long March. Well, basically, um, instead of going to the cities and trying to get support from the uh, proletariat there, he goes out to the villages and supplies the peasants with like food and medicine. And well, uh, the best thing happened for uh, Mount Zedong was when Japan started the war with China. This basically diverted Chiang Kai-shek's attention away from him. And also, now Mao Zedong could appear like a national hero because he's given the natives food, weapons, medicine, and he's fighting the Chinese as well as Chiang Kai-shek. Well, after the war, everybody thought, both America and the USSR, thought that the nationalists would come back in and take control. Even though the US had found the government of Chiang Kai-shek to be corrupt, tyrannical, and totally inefficient. I mean, during the war with Japan, you had Chinese generals who were taking bribes so that they basically allowed the Chinese to win battles. And by 1949, the um, communists have taken over uh, Peking, which uh, is now Beijing. And had taken over Canton, and basically the nationalists had to flee to Formosa, which is now Taiwan. Now this shocked America, because we had given uh, Chiang Kai-shek more than two million bucks. You know, we had done what we thought we had to do. Well, because we didn't want communism to spread, this caused America to support, to recognize French Indochina, which is this area right here, a bunch of French colonies, and support Emperor Bao Dai in Vietnam, who was fighting against Ho Chi Minh, who was fighting for Vietnamese independence. So this is our first entry into Vietnam, because we're supporting the French colonial uh, efforts there. All right, next slide. That same year, scientists are shocked when they find an unusually high 
amount of radioactivity in the air, this can only mean one thing, that the Russians have an atomic bomb. Well, what's Truman's response? Truman's response is to immediately call for a more powerful bomb, or the hydrogen bomb. And not only does he do that, but NSC-68 basically calls for a buildup of conventional arms, like more tanks, more ships, more artillery guns. Now, why do you think he wanted to get more conventional weapons? Well, I mean, like right now, our war on terror, we've got nuclear bombs. Why don't we just throw nuclear bombs on Afghanistan until they surrender? Well, because that's not right. We want options outside of merely going nuclear, as well as threats that hopefully will prevent us from having to go nuclear. Korea. The Korean conflict. Now, Korea had basically been, it had fought for its independence from China. Uh, then, after World War I, Japan took it over. Uh, and after World War II, it becomes its own nation. And Russia supports, it's divided into two different countries. Russia supports North Korea. America supports South Korea. And there was supposed to be a vote to unite the country. But by 1948, those two uh, nations have developed into totally separate regimes. I mean, one's communist and one's uh, capitalist. And guys, there's no better example of a difference between these two systems and that the people of Korea were both pretty poor farmers. I mean, their population consisted pretty much of farmers. And now South Korea, that's capitalist, they, they produce goods, they manufacture goods, they go around the world, their culture has gone around the world. North Korea, not only are the people starving, but there's only one city that has electricity at night, the capital of Pyongyang. Okay? Uh, and what, as they are totally separate regimes, they're not going to be getting together. Now, we didn't realize until after the fall of the Soviet Union that Stalin had actually given a war plan to North Korea that would have allowed them to have invaded the South, capturing Seoul. Seoul is about right there. Pyongyang Bang is right about there. To uh, capture Seoul, the capital of South Korea, in about three days, and take all of the um, peninsula within a week. And much to everybody's surprise, on June 25th, 1950, North Korea uh, invaded the South. This shocked Truman, who said, this attack upon Korea makes it plain beyond all doubt that communism has passed beyond the use of subversion to conquer independent nations and will now use armed invasion and war. He reacted incredibly quickly. Basically, an emergency meeting of the Security Council at the UN was called, and uh, North Korea, I mean, the USSR was boycotting us so they weren't on the Security Council because we didn't recognize communist China. So basically, it was passed that the UN would furnish assistance to restore international peace and security in the area. And 14 nations agreed to go along. Nations that included like Turkey, the Britain, but the largest uh, part of the military forces was supplied by the United States of America. Ready? Oh, it's my name. Cause I'm Andy G. I'm Dynamite. I'm Andy G.
But then I told ACDC, hey, hey, change the lyrics. I don't know, TNT, I don't know. So who's going to be in charge of this whole shooting match? Why it's General Douglas MacArthur, same guy who was in charge of the Pacific uh, troops during World War II. And basically, we go into this conflict by order of the president, not by Congress. This is seen as a police action because Congress never voted on a declaration of war. Unlike our current actions in the War of Terror, where they did vote on a declaration of war, making it America's longest war. Ready for the next slide? Don't be so excited. And man, you know, we're caught totally by surprise. We're trying to get stuff over there. Uh, by uh, within the first three months, I mean, they're just pushing, pushing, pushing. Our, uh, the Republic of Korea forces and uh, the US and UN are stuck in a little, little toenail of uh, the peninsula known as the Pusan Perimeter. But just 14 days later, uh, an incredible attack would be launched. On September 15th, we landed our forces at Incheon. And Incheon was a place where um, the uh, differences between high and low tide was 45 feet. So basically, um, General MacArthur had a 15 minute window to launch his troops. He took all the troops from reserves in Korea, I mean Japan, uh, take, took them over to Incheon. He had to take five targets. Because of that minute window, he could only uh, went, uh, deploy troops to take three of the targets. Had to wait a full 24 hours for the changing of the tides again to launch the next attack where he took the other two. And now that he struck them from behind, he starts to go across. Meanwhile, there's a huge push out at Pusan, uh, and the North Korean army is in a headlong retreat. And so much so that by October 1st, they pretty much have the north out of South Korea. So he crosses the 38th parallel into North Korea. Now, what's the problem with that? What's the problem with MacArthur going into North Korea? Well, the UN had voted and they told him just to restore peace and security in South Korea. Kind of like guys, years later, Saddam Hussein invaded uh, Kuwait. So the UN told him get out of Kuwait. He didn't, so we went to war to liberate Kuwait. And once we liberated Kuwait, we didn't go into uh, Iraq. We couldn't. Our hands have been tied. Well, he goes ahead and he crosses the line. And on October 7th, it was made official. You know, can he do that? Can he? Well, I guess he can. Because MacArthur was thinking, hey, you don't leave these guys in power. They attacked us. They're going to attack us again. Ready for the next line? So um, they're pressing really far into the north. And on October 20th, uh, China starts preparing their troops because they do not want uh, capitalists right next to China that is separated by the Yalu River. And, um, you know, MacArthur's bragging. He says, hey, this whole war is going to be over by Christmas. But on the night of November 25th, as our forces are approaching the Yalu, basically the Chinese, they start attacking us with human waves. I mean, basically we run out of bullets before they run out of bodies. And we have to go on a retreat. Barely able to make it. Because our troops have been overextended. Because we thought, hey, victory is certain. We're not going to get attacked. The only there was like one general who did follow protocol and established supply posts, which made him go a little slower. The other generals laughed at him, but his supplies 
basically made uh, the survivability of the UN forces in the retreat. And uh, MacArthur almost immediately begins the blame dig game. Uh, he wants to uh, expand the war, bomb Manchuria, blockade China, have Taiwanese nationalists invade the Chinese mainland, and even do stuff like uh, just drop new atomic bombs across the Yalu River, that border, a cobalt curtain that will kill, irradiate, kill any uh, Chinese nationalist that tries to support North Korea. By June of 1951, Fort UN forces under General Ridgway were finally able to secure the lines and launch a counterattack, which gets the troops somewhat back to the 38th parallel. In a zigzaggy way. Ready for the next slide? Well, once we're back up to the 38th parallel, Truman uses that opportunity to ask China and North Korea if they want to uh, discuss peace. Uh, of course, on the same day, MacArthur sends an ultimatum to China to make peace or it was going to be too, uh, attacked. Now, this is like too much for Truman because not only had uh, MacArthur been whining about him the whole time, but you had little instances like this is where they met, it's either on Guam or on Wake, where MacArthur's airplane got there before President Truman. He ordered his pilot to circle the airfield until Truman's plane had landed because he wanted to force the president to come to his plane to greet him rather than him going to uh, Truman's plane to greet the president, his commanding officer. So on um, April 11th, 1951, Basically, MacArthur is removed from his position. And, of course, to the people, oh, he's a hero. The American people, initially, they were in favor of MacArthur. You know, especially his troops that had fought underneath him in World War II. Well, they called for a Senate investigation to see if Truman's actions were correct. And as it's come to no surprise, Truman's, um, Truman's actions were justified. They were like, yeah, uh, MacArthur did deserve that. <clears throat> so then on June 24th, 1951, the Soviet representative at the UN proposed a ceasefire and an armistice along the 38th parallel. Our Secretary of State, Dean Atkinson, accepted in principle, and a few days later, China and North Korea agreed. Uh, of course, this was just as Ridgeway's meat grinder offensive was inflicting severe losses among the Chinese and North Korean troops. Basically, peace talks start on July 10th, 1951, and almost from the get-go, snags. Uh, trouble, the discussions like um, uh, how, how are the prisoners going to be, the prisoners of war going to be repatriated and um, the, pre the president of South Korea said we need to be one country, not this half and half. That held up negotiations. Indeed, it's not until Truman is no longer president for more than two years they discussed. But finally, a uh, truce was called on July 27, 1953, creating a de demilitarized zone or a DMZ 2.5 miles wide, uh, roughly along the 38th parallel, a little bit below, a little bit above. And there was no final peace conference. So guys in Korea, we are still under nothing more than a ceasefire. What were the casualties of this war? Well, the US had 33,000 33, casualties. South Korea had a million. 
and North Korea and China had 1.5 million. You ready? Another red scare. Well, guys, I mean, a lot of people are wondering what, what the heck happened. You know, the communists, they pretty much took over Eastern Europe. They took over China. They attacked us in Korea. Um, what, what the heck is going on? Who are we going to blame? Well, we might have to blame ourselves. Now, as early as 1938, the House on American Activities Committee, or HUAC, was put in charge to search for subversives in government. And, by and in 1945, they finally uh, found secret American documents in a communist-sponsored magazine. You know, that's one of the blessings and curses of having a free society is sometimes information it gets slipped out. Have any of y'all ever seen like Hunt for Red October or Patriot Games? Tom Clancy, the guy who writes those, who is so accurate in his stuff that people should not know about the actual power of our machines that the FBI has actually investigated. How would you know that? I figured it out. Well, after this discovery, uh, the the uh, fire to find these subversives is put on. Truman starts a loyalty program where he, uh, a loyalty test was asked of all who per were employed by the federal government. During this investigation, three million people were cleared. 2,000 were reassigned. 212 were dismissed. I love that uh, political cartoon there. You see the director of the FBI is holding the federal employee's ink-stained hand, saying to Uncle Sam, it's messy business, but it can't hurt those who come in here with clean hands. And guys, you know what this is just like? That y'all don't even think anything of it because you're normalized. It's normal for you. It wasn't normal for me. Do you both y'all have your driver's license? Okay, what do they do when you go to the DMZ to get your driver's license? Got to fill out the forms, right? Give it to them. Show them you passed the driving test. Show them your permit. What else? Huh? They take your fingerprint. Let's see, who, who else do we take the fingerprint of? Oh, yeah, criminals. And of course, I had to get fingerprinted at word dual credit, which is understandable because I mean we don't want you know a deviant or anything like the or a murderer or a thief uh, being uh, employed. But how how can the government legalize treating us like a common criminal if we want our driver's license? Well, driving isn't a right. It's a privilege. So if you don't want the government to have your uh, thumbprint, then don't get a driver's license. Hey! hey. <laughs> but anyway, it cleared a lot of people. Well, then we have the Hiss case with Alger Hiss, who was the president of the Carnegie Foundation for International Peace. I mean, uh, Hiss was working with nations to try to make the country more peaceful, the world more peaceful. Uh, meanwhile, in England, a spy by the name of Whitaker Chambers was caught, and he was working with the Soviets. Well, uh, he said that Alger Hiss worked with him, passed off secret documents, you know, it was a real fantastical story about in a, a pumpkin patch that he'd slip the microfilm into this fake pumpkin and leave, and then Whitaker Chambers would come and get it. Of course, Alger Hiss denies the whole thing, but uh, the committee still found him guilty 
that he had lied and he was found guilty of perjury, which is lying in court. And one of the things that really comes to the fore about this is that one member of the GUAC committee, the guy who was leading it, was a young uh, Richard Melhouse Nixon. Well, that's, I think, his is lying. His guilty on both uh, per perjury counts. But we do have cases like the Rosenbergs. Who are the Rosenbergs? The Rosenbergs were part of a uh, British American spy network that was selling uh, atomic secrets to the Russians. Now, why were they selling atomic uh, secrets to the Russians? Because they didn't think that it was right that only America had atomic bombs. I mean, sure, America used it uh, with, uh, used it correctly now, but having power like that is too tempting. The only way to balance things out is to make sure that another power has the same exact weapons. They were totally found guilty. Julius and Ethel Rosenberg totally found guilty, convicted of espionage, and in 1953, they were both executed. Ready for the next one? Oh, then we get good old Tail Gunner Joe. A uh, guy who got his uh, name, Tail Gunner Joe, because he was a tail gunner in World War II. Um, he basically now was senator, and he figured out how or why America was losing so bad. For him, the reason why America was losing was because the State Department was infested with communists. And on February 9th, 1950, was the first time he claimed that he had a list of names of communists working in the State Department. Now, of course, at times this list had 152 names, other times had 81, uh, other times 56. A lot of people say that he didn't have any names whatsoever. But, with even though he had no proof, with wild abandon and a religious zeal, he went out pursuing communists. And even though he never uncovered a single communist, I mean, if you stood up against them, that was only proof that you were a communist. Well, because of this fear, the McCarran Internal Security Act was passed because of anti-communist fear. that even though Truman vetoed it, it went back to the legislature and they overrode his veto. It made it unlawful to combine, conspire, or agree with any other person to perform any act which would substantially contribute to the establishment of a totalitarian government. Ready for the next slide? Then, if you were a communist or a communist front organization, you had to register with the Attorney General. That, by the way, ruined uh, the lives of a lot of careers for some of the actors and other workers in uh, Hollywood. Because, you know, during the 20s or 30s, they may have just gone to one party meeting but you have to put that down, and once you put that down, you were blacklisted, where you couldn't be hired. And if you were an alien or a non-citizen belonging to a totalitarian organizations, you were denied entry into our country. Kind of like a no-fly list. 